Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. This morning we'll be talking remotely with Dr. Walter Short. Dr. Short is an orthopedic hand surgeon who practices at the Syracuse Hand and Wrist Center in Syracuse, New York. Dr. Short completed his orthopedic training at SUNY Health Sciences Center. For many years, he served as a professor of orthopedic hand surgery at SUNY Health Sciences Center. Good morning, Dr. Short. Good morning. Dr. Short, I thought what we would discuss is a condition called Dupuytren's contracture. This is a problem that occurs in a certain segment of the population, mostly folks of, uh, I think, Northern European descent. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about that condition, how that condition occurs, and what patients might experience when they have that condition. It, uh, Dupuytren's contracture is a condition uh, most common in uh, uh, men of uh, Northern European descent. It usually starts uh, in middle age, uh, it is, and as I said, it's more common in men than in women. Uh, what uh, people first notice about uh, uh, Dupuytren's contracture is that they notice uh, uh, thick nodules in the palm of their hand, uh, and as time goes on over the course of many months or years, these nodules uh, start to form together to form uh, cords in their uh, palm which extend into their fingers, most commonly the ring and little finger. Initially, uh, 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 to the patient, they look like their tendons which are sticking out of their skin or bulging the skin. And as time goes on, as these cords start to uh, get thicker, they uh, start to pull the fingers down and uh, the uh, patient notices that he can't uh, extend his fingers or straighten out his fingers, which makes it difficult for him to put his hands in his pockets, uh, put gloves on, wash his face, uh, do a lot of uh, daily activities which everybody else takes for granted. Do we have any idea as to what causes these nodules? What, what's the actual problem in the hand resulting in the contractures? Theory which seems to be makes make the most common sense is uh, that uh, the people that develop Dupuytren's contracture have a predisposition to form a different type of collagen, and collagen is the material that that makes up uh, uh, tendons, uh, ligaments, uh, and this uh, specialized uh, tissue in the palm, which makes the palm very durable, and this type of collagen. Uh, in, in these people that develop Dupuytren's has the unusual property of uh, being able to contract or get smaller. Now we talked about how this disease tends to have some sort of generic or genetic predisposition. Is this a sort of thing of where, where, where if your father had this disease then you're likely to have it? Are you absolutely going to have it? Uh, how does a patient rate their risk if they are from Northern European descent? and they have a family member that may have Dupuytren's contracture? Uh, if you have a family history of Dupuytren's contracture, you are more likely to develop Dupuytren's contracture, but it is uh, certainly uh, definitely not guaranteed that you're going to have Dupuytren's contracture. Uh, but the, but uh, certainly more than half the people that I see in my practice who are of Northern European descent, if you ask them, to go back and talk to uh, their family. They can remember a grandfather or great-grandfather that had uh, 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 fingers that uh, were bent or they described their fingers as being bent at an uh, elderly age. Now other than just having the contractures and the problems with using the hand because of the contractures, does this condition cause any pain? I mean, is, is it a painful sort of thing that causes other symptoms? Uh, it, it's not uh, known to be painful at all. It's, uh, it's just a, a problem associated with uh, your ability to not being able to extend your fingers uh, and the difficulties associated with that. So when you're uh, trying to put on gloves, as I said, or, or, or put your fingers in a, a narrow spot, uh, the fingers that are involved in Dupuytren's uh, just don't bend the appropriate way. How extensive can this get? Can, can this involve the whole hand? Does it involve both hands? 
What's the general presentation that you see as an orthopedic surgeon in these patients? I usually see it, uh, uh, they usually present to me uh, either in two groups. They notice little nodules in their uh, palms and they are concerned that this is uh, something other, other than a nodule. It may be, you know, they're concerned about uh, tumors, uh, cancer, uh, and that's usually in its very earliest stage. And in that, that stage, when it doesn't affect the mobility of the fingers, uh, no treatment is necessary. Uh, the next group of patients are those patients uh, that develop the, uh, the, the Dupuytrens and have uh, then gone on to develop contractures of their fingers uh, such that they can't straighten out their fingers. Those people are bothered, uh, especially in, in climate around Syracuse, uh, they can't really put gloves on and so uh, their fingers start to become cold because they can't protect their fingers in the cold weather. They can't put their hands in their pockets. Uh, those types of activities usually bring them uh, to their family physician and then they're referred uh, to a hand specialist. Well, as a hand specialist, how do you evaluate a patient with Dupuytren's contracture? Is this something that is pretty obvious when you see the patient? Is there anything special that you need to do in terms of either x-rays, imaging of some sort, or any type of lab test that are needed? Uh, to uh, a trained professional, Dupuytren's contracture is uh, relatively obvious uh, because we see it uh, very commonly in our practice. Uh, to other specialists who see it rarely, they may have a, uh, somewhat of a, uh, a relatively more difficult time because it's uh, 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 not as common in their clinical practice. Uh, to, there's no blood tests that need to be done. There's really no genetic counseling at the present time that I'm aware of that, will, that is necessary. Uh, if a patient comes who has uh, severe contractures of the fingers where the fingers are bent way down uh, and you are contemplating treatment, it, it uh, I get x-rays and the reason to get the x-rays is to make sure that there's no deformity of the bones or the joints uh, secondary to the long-term uh, contractures which may have deformed the joints and therefore not allow uh, relatively normal motion after you have treated the Dupuytren's contracture. So if the contracture is severe then I do get x-rays, uh, but other than that, uh, there is no blood tests or uh, other tests that really need to be done. Well, let's talk a little bit about treatment. When you sit down with a patient that has Dupuytren's contracture, what sort of discussion are you having with that patient in terms of what you're going to propose to them? You mentioned that in some cases the patient may not need surgery, may not need treatment, and, and may not need anything right now. Do you anticipate that the condition is going to progress to the point to where you do need to consider treatment? How do you have that discussion with the patient? When I uh, see the patient, uh, I evaluate the hand. I uh, uh, take a history to see if there's other family members that may have Dupuytren's contracture. Uh, and then I counsel the patient and I tell them, after that, I evaluate their hand and if they have no contracture, I tell them uh, just to watch uh, these uh, nodules and these cords or bands. Uh, and there's a test called the tabletop test. And I ask them uh, uh, on a uh, relatively f uh, regular interval to put their hand flat on a table. And if they can see sunlight between their hand and the table, then I tell them that that is the time to start to consider treatment uh, for the condition. And uh, when there's uh, sunlight underneath the uh, palm of your hand, that means that there's a contracture uh, and the fingers are bent to the point where it might be worthwhile to consider uh, treatment for the Dupuytren's contracture. Uh, if a patient comes and has contractures already, I measure the severity of the contracture 
I also uh, determine what uh, which fingers are involved. Uh, it is uh, known that if the contracture involves the uh, knuckle, the metacarpal phalangeal joint, that is usually somewhat easier to treat and has a, a better result than if it involves the uh, joint uh, uh, following the metacarpal phalangeal joint or the proximal interphalangeal joint, if that joint is involved, then uh, I encourage the patient to treat that a little bit more aggressively because if the finger is left bent at that position, then uh, they, would have, they would have less than uh, normal motion. You know, I, I think there are a lot of patients that are going to wonder if there is anything that can slow down this process that they can do, something like physical therapy or braces or anything that can be used as a prevention. Are you aware of anything that can affect the natural progression of the disease? I know of a lot of patients that try braces and try stretching, uh, but to my knowledge and the uh, uh, literature seems to support the fact that bracing and stretching really don't affect the long-term natural history of this condition. Well, we talked a little bit about the treatment in terms of general philosophy. Let's move on and, and talk a bit about specifics in terms of treatment. When you've decided that a patient is actually needing something active done, what options do they have? There's uh, actually two, uh, well, actually there's three options. Uh, one is uh, surgery. Uh, where an incision is made in the skin uh, and this band of tissue is uh, surgically uh, uh, removed. Uh, the second option is uh, what they call needle aponeurectomy, which is a medical term where uh, a, basically a hypodermic needle is placed through the skin and the uh, sharp edge of the needle is used to cut or break apart the uh, cord or the band of Dupuytren's contracture. And uh, uh, recently, over the past approximately nine months to a year, uh, medication uh, has become available, which has been de in development for approximately 10 years, which uh, dissolves portions of this cord uh, and breaks apart the cord uh, so that uh, normal motion is restored. Let's discuss how you make the decision whether a patient is better off having either full-blown surgery to remove the cord versus when you decide to do either the mechanical release, I believe you term that aponeurectomy? Correct. Or whether they may be a candidate for the new treatment uh, with the medication. How do you make that decision? I make the decision uh, based upon the severity of the contracture. If uh, people uh, come to me and the uh, metacarpal phalangeal joint is uh, only contracted and they have a uh, isolated cord uh, to one or two fingers, uh, then I feel that uh, they would be a candidate for the injection of the medication which uh, uh, dissolves the uh, uh, band of tissue. And this uh, medication is a chemical which uh, basically uh, dissolves or weakens the uh, band or cord in, in the hand. If uh, an, another option when it's at this relatively earlier stage is the uh, needle aponeurectomy uh, and of those two, uh, my preference at the present time is to uh, inject uh, the medication, uh, uh, which uh, in my experience uh, has given a, uh, somewhat a better result. Uh, if as a uh, disease progresses and they have uh, contractures uh, which approach a uh, 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 a degree where the joint is at a right angle, then I feel that uh, uh, surgery is probably a better option because uh, not only is the cord involved, you need to re re cut the cord and remove the cord, but you also have to uh, uh, release the contracture around the joint 
because a joint has been bent at uh, such a severe angle for such a long time that the ligaments and the tissues which support the joint are also contracted and they need uh, surgical attention also. Well, it sounds like patients would be better off treating this earlier rather than later. I'm assuming that what we just discussed is that this condition progresses at a slow rate and you don't just all of a sudden wake up uh, with your fingers flexed at 90 degrees. So am I correct in assuming that patients should be a little more aggressive in looking at some of these less aggressive techniques earlier on in the disease process rather than just letting this go and trying to ignore it? Absolutely. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the treatment is sort of uh, uh, to observe the condition until that point where the fingers uh, just start to contract and they can't put their hand flat on the table. Once they can't put their hand flat on the table, that's the time when it is uh, the easiest to treat uh, non-surgically, either with the uh, medication, uh, which is injected into the cord, or the use of the needle, which breaks apart the cord. Uh, and that requires uh, no surgery. Uh, it requires much less uh, uh, treatment after the, the injection uh, and uh, the patient is uh, uh, has to spend a lot less time involved in post-operative or, or post-treatment uh, care of their hand. Now in these two treatments, the aponeurectomy and the, the medication that is injected, are these procedures done in the office? Is there anything special that has to be done? or do they have to be done in the operating room or a surgery center? No. Uh, 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 my preference is the uh, medication, uh, which is uh, uh, a, a, uh, ordered uh, from the company. Uh, and uh, what is done is the, the medication, which is called Zyaflex, uh, is uh, uh, reconstituted um, and then uh, it is injected into the cord uh, at the level of the joint. Uh, afterwards, uh, the patient starts uh, using his hand and trying to stretch the finger out so it becomes straight. In uh, cases where the contracture is mild, the patient usually can break up the cord all by himself. Uh, I've made it a point to see the patient 24 hours after the injection, and if the cord is not broken apart uh, or he still has a contracture, then I uh, numb the finger up with uh, Novocaine or Xylocaine and then uh, stretch the finger uh, under some local anesthetic, which in uh, the vast majority of cases uh, uh, breaks apart the cord and the patient then has full motion of the finger. What about treatment in any of these techniques in terms of progression of the disease? I am assuming that all of these techniques treat the contractor. Does the contractor or the disease process continue after treatment? Does this recur? Uh, by removing the tissue or breaking apart the tissue, you haven't cured the disease process. The, the, the tissue that forms these bands uh, continues on and, and uh, yes, there can be recurrence. The, uh, uh, the uh, fact in the patient's favor is that it uh, progresses so slowly that it may be years before this has to be done again. Uh, so surgery or the injection or the needle is not a cure but it restores the function of the hand and it may be years before this starts to contract again. And uh, so it may need to be repeated again, but usually not for many years. Let's talk a little bit about the surgical treatment of the disease. I mean, it obviously sounds like that if you can get to this disease process early and you're able to do the injection or possibly do the release that you talked about, that you may be able to avoid major surgery. In the cases where you do surgery, however, can you talk a little bit about how extensive that procedure is and what you're concerned with as a surgeon when you go in and do that type of surgery? 
Uh, if the patient has uh, severe contractures where the finger is uh, bent uh, to an extreme angle, say 90 degrees or, or, or more, then uh, that requires a surgical intervention that is done in an operating room, although uh, the patient uh, should be able to uh, go home after the surgical procedure, so it is considered an outpatient procedure. It is usually done uh, by uh, blocking the arm with a, um, a block done by an anesthesiologist or, a general, anas uh, uh, or general anesthesia. Uh, a, in many cases, a uh, zigzag inc incision is made over the cord uh, of the Dupuytren's contracture. And in these cases where the patient has ignored the problem for several years, multiple fingers may be involved. So an incision has to be made essentially over each contracted cord that goes to each finger. Uh, and then there has to be meticulous dissection of the, of the Dupuytren's cord to distinguish it from relatively normal tissue. And uh, to the untrained eye, the diseased tissue uh, looks almost identical to the normal tissue. In addition, uh, because the uh, cord uh, has become so contracted, the anatomy of the uh, blood vessels and the nerves have become distorted. And the nerves and the blood vessels can be entwined in this Dupuytren's uh, tissue so it becomes uh, uh, a uh, uh, long and relatively involved process to separate the cord from the blood vessel and the nerve to separate the two so that the Dupuytren's tissue can be excised and not damage the nerve and the blood vessel. After the cord or this Dupuytren's uh, tissue is removed, uh, if the patient is uh, ignored the problem for a long time, the, the joint capsule or the ligaments of the joint may be stiffened or contracted and therefore the surgeon may need to cut or release this tissue in order to allow the finger to straighten up normally. A third problem is that if the finger has been bent for a, a, a very long time, the tendon which straightens out the finger may have become stretched out or elongated and uh, in that case uh, uh, they would need to do physical therapy. They need to be very vigorous in their attempts to move the finger following the surgery. Uh, so after all of the uh, tissue is removed, the blood vessels and the nerves are protected and make sure that they aren't damaged during the surgery. Afterwards, the, the patient is then usually sent to physical therapy to uh, start moving the hand and making sure that they uh, regain uh, relatively normal motion of the finger. Let's talk about something that surgeons don't like to think about, and that's what might go wrong. Can you give me an idea of what the complications are? As far as the surgery goes, uh, the, uh, the complications uh, can be um, several. One is uh, that you, the surgeon can inadvertently cut a small nerve that gives you feeling at the tip of the finger. Uh, uh, and uh, that is uh, due to the fact that the nerve uh, uh, may spiral uh, around this cord of Dupuytren's and uh, it is very difficult to distinguish one from the other in, in some circumstances. Uh, another problem is that once you make all of these incisions in the skin, uh, you may uh, develop uh, what they call a hematoma, which is a collection of blood underneath the uh, skin flaps, which uh, can drain or uh, result in an infection. Uh, the skin flaps can uh, die because of uh, uh, the multiple areas of skin that have to be uh, uh, moved while you uh, cut uh, out this Dupuytren's band. Uh, so there can be uh, uh, loss of uh, skin. 
Uh, and in addition, uh, if the contracture is uh, left for a long period of time by the patient, uh, it is uh, more than likely that he may not get full motion uh, as an end result. Following the surgery, uh, uh, there is a recurrence rate, and the recurrence rate uh, can vary from 10% to 70 or 80 percent, depending upon the severity of the contracture and uh, how long you wait after the surgery to determine if there's a recurrence rate. And what about the other two procedures, the needle procedure and the medication injection? Are you worried about complications with either of these two procedures? I worry about complications after any procedure, and the complications that have been reported after the uh, Zyaflex injection are uh, in rare cases, uh, you can uh, inject it into a um, spot where there's not a cord and you may damage the tendon which moves the finger. Uh, you may damage a uh, nerve or a blood vessel if it is not injected directly into the cord. Uh, the uh, procedure where you use a needle to uh, cut or break apart the cord uh, is a uh, it can, in some cases, uh, damage a uh, nerve or a blood vessel. Uh, and in both those cases, uh, there is uh, some instances where the cord is not uh, completely broken apart uh, and uh, the patient regains full extension. So there is a failure rate in, in uh, uh, Take, uh, of removing the cord in those two cases. Well, this has been an excellent, comprehensive discussion of Dupuytren's contracture. Is, is anything else that you feel like patients should know that we have not discussed up to this point? I think people have to realize that uh, it is uh, a condition which uh, ne needs treatment, not initially when, when, it, when the little nodules are noted, but it is a uh, condition which is easily treated once they start to develop a uh, slight contracture of their finger. And if they choose to ignore it, the uh, problem uh, gets worse and worse, and the uh, treatment uh, involves more time uh, on the patient's part, and the results are uh, less likely to be satisfactory to the patient the longer he ignores the problem. Well, I think that's excellent advice, Dr. Short, and I want to thank you for, for an excellent discussion and some great information about Dupuytren's contracture. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.